everybody. Welcome. My name is Catherine Montalbano, and I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Communication. And this is our first series as part of the Diversity Speaker Series. So thank you so much for coming. The Department of Communication at App State University is pleased to present the Diversity Speaker Series. The series is designed to enrich the department, College of Fine and Applied Arts, University, by inviting speakers whose presentations address issues of cultural, political, and social importance, with particular attention paid to matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So our first guest and first to kick off the series is Dr. Shannon uh, B. Campbell, who is currently serving as the Dean of the College of Fine and Applied Arts here at App State. <clears throat> Dr. Campbell joined the university in July of 2021 and immediately hit the ground learning. She implemented a number of practices to demonstrate her commitment to radical transparency by ensuring all Dean's office and Council of Chair meetings are open and all agendas and minutes of these meetings are publicly posted. Her deep commitment to being accessible to faculty, staff, and students is illustrated <clears throat> by a number of new programs she instituted, including Donuts with the Dean, my personal favorite, <laughs> for faculty, staff, and students, deep dives with the Dean for the faculty, critical conversations with the Dean for students, and even lectures in classrooms upon request. She is a powerful advocate for our college's student-first and transdisciplinary approach to learning, and she has worked tirelessly to unify the disciplines within the college under the umbrella of our steadfast belief in the power of experiential learning. Dean Campbell came to App State from the Metropolitan State University of Denver, where she served as the Associate Vice President of Graduate Student Studies for four years. While at MSU, she developed centralized policies and procedures, led the Graduate Council, and represented graduate studies at the university level. <clears throat> she has served as a higher education administrator for over a decade, and as a professor of strategic communication for 25 years. As a critical cultural media scholar, Dr. Campbell is interested in amplifying marginalized voices. She is a first-generation college graduate, and she is passionate about decolonizing higher education curricula and promoting higher education as the access point to the American dream. Dr. Campbell received her BS in communication management from Missouri State University, MA in organizational, organizational communication from Southern Illinois University, and PhD in Journalism and Media Studies from the University of Texas, Austin. So now we'll turn over the microphone to my colleague, Carlos Montero, and he will introduce the first set of the uh, Fireside Chat. Thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. I'm Carlos Montero. I'm the lecturer of the Communication Department. Um, we're going to have a conversation, a fun conversation. AI, the one who don't know me very, I work the last 22 years for CNN. CNN, they train us to do tough questions. So I don't want to start with the tough questions. How much do you hate Donald Trump? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, but I want, uh, let me tell you how it's going to be. It's going to be a conversation, but one of, the, I see some journalist student here. The more difficult of an interview is you, the secret to do a good interview, you have to listen. And the second thing, what you have to do? Maybe some of the students there. Follow up questions. You have to listen and follow up questions. And I want that you help me to do that because I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Campbell some questions and I want you to listen. And if there is any follow up question, and I need your help. So, Adam, if you can, after the Dr. Campbell answer the question, please, you are going to be listen, very careful. And you can ask questions. You raise your hands and I'm going to give you the chance to help me as a reporter with the follow up question that something. So important to the students, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we were listening to what Katie was talking about you, you know? And it's really interesting, your career. And we would like to know uh, if you can tell us a bit about your paths prior to and leading to your position here at App State. What's the most important thing? What do you remember the most? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to use the mic? Or? You need the mic. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I started my career a lot like a lot of you in the audience. I was a strategic communication major, um, so I was in the Department of Communication at a university that was a lot like App State. So I went to a large 
regional comprehensive university and I interned at the university and um, as you all know from the introduction, I'm a first generation college student. So for me, the access point to even getting into the field was a good internship. My first job out of college was at Fleischman Hillard. Do you know Fleischman Hillard? Yeah. Large multinational no, PR no, agency. No, no, anyone who knows? So I started working with Fleischman Hillard at their uh, headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri, and then I left with a client. Um, I left with Exxon. So I went to work for Exxon in Texas. And one of the things you will find out today is I have a really deep and genuine commitment to social justice um, and to sustainability. And working for a large multinational fossil fuel company did not sit well with my ethics. And so after a number of years, I ended up leaving Exxon, went back to graduate school, pursued my PhD, and entered um, the academy. So that's how I got here. You know, 18-year-old Shannon would have never imagined where I am today. I just wouldn't have even known what a dean is, what a dean does. I just wouldn't have imagined being here. One of, one of my students today asked me exactly what I was telling him. I want to have that conversation with you. What you were saying, what does the dean do? What do you do? <laughs> well, I have to tell you, um, for me, as we've said in the intro, I really have a deep commitment to radical transparency. And so what that means for me is that I not only manage and supervise uh, my own office staff mm -hmm. of about 12 people, and our job is to really make sure that the college operates in such a way that we can make sure that the students always come first and that the students' needs are met. But above and beyond managing and supervising, I would say I also mentor the people who work with me. I support the people who work with me. And I think it's important to say that I support them because one thing you will never hear me say is that we're a family, right? When you think of someone as a family, you think of, okay, I'm gonna have obligations, I'm gonna do things that I wouldn't necessarily do because we're a family. No, we're not a family. A family doesn't fire one another and a family doesn't furlough one another. So students, please understand when you go to work, it's not a family. But what it is is you're a part of a caring community and a community that should support you and a community that you should support. Um, but always go in and be professional. So I, I come in and I'm professional, prepared, I support, I make sure that my office has access to professional development so that they can be the best they can be so that the students get the best service that they deserve. Um, I serve as a liaison between the college and then executive leadership, so that's where my PR skills come into play. I'm always advocating for the students, the faculty, and the staff of the College of Fine and Applied Arts. I made sure that when I came in, I recognized, yes, there are different disciplines, seven different departments, but that we are all committed to experiential learning, that we are a college of makers and doers and dreamers, not just learners, that we have thought leaders and we have practice leaders, and I don't enfranchise one over the other, that everyone brings something new and unique for our students who get a well-rounded education. I develop procedures, budgets, make presentations, all the boring stuff. The real fun job is being a professor and interacting with the students every day, right? I love it, yes. It yeah, is. and my job is to make sure that you're able to do that to the best of your ability. But you know, you were saying, I mean, it's so funny that you mentioned about that. Some You're going to work, some of you, when you leave college to work for a company, and more probably they're going to say, hi, family. And mm -hmm. I used to have my news director at CNN, all the editorial meetings, he started with, hola, familia, mm -hmm. hi, family, hola, familia. And, and the funny thing is that we knew we were not a family because after that we were making fun of all those because we said, I mean, family, what you were saying, mm -hmm. they're not going to fire you. They're not going to make you stay away from your family. And this mm -hmm. business is crazy. And I mean, I, I, I think it's fantastic because I mean, I remember that, hola, familia. Yeah. Every morning was hola, familia. And we were looking at each other and saying, we are not a family. Exxon too. We are not a family. <laughs> I would like to know now a little bit about your experience. You moved from Texas uh -huh. to North Carolina. How was, you like the boom? You like the university? How do you feel? Okay. Well, I will say this about being in Boone. There's a sense of familiarity for me because some of you may not know this. I'm from the Ozarks originally. 
So I'm from a rural place um, with a culture that's similar to Appalachia. So for me, it was a very easy transition. It's like a homecoming for me. Same with the university. I told you I graduated with my undergraduate degree from a university very similar to App State. About 20,000 students, large, regional, comprehensive, in the same college that you all are in, some of the same majors. And I think that I'm able to empathize with the students in this college because 90% of our students are homegrown like I was. I was from the state of Missouri. One in three are first gen like I am. Um, so I think I have a lot in common with the students, well, you know, 40 or years ago. But still, we, I have a lot in common with the students that make up the student body of our College of Fine and Applied Arts. And what about food? What do you think about the town? And well, the weather too. I mean, the we, weather. Have, we have snow <laughs> everywhere. And Saturday was crazy. Listen, it's no secret. I'm a sister with natural hair, okay. right? So the rain, the humidity, so, uh, no bueno. No but <laughs> but um, I like Boone. I like the culture. I like the music. I get down with all of that. But the weather, no. No, no, no. no. I agree with you. We're at the okay. same page. You were talking before about the fact that you, your previous scholarship center on race oh, yeah. and, and media. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can give us the highlights, some of the key uh, examples you have to work that would be of interest for the students, okay. working with uh, race and media. Okay. Well, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a critical cultural media scholar. I'm proud to say that. And what that means for me is that I have always examined the media and looked at the power structures that exists within the media. How the media gives power to certain people and takes away power from marginalized people. And we do that in a number of ways. The ways that we shoot video, the language that we use, and you all are communication or people, you understand the power of language. So I have looked at reality television, its depictions, how it impacts the viewers, and I started that a long time ago, back in the 90s when Cops was the first reality show on TV. And I knew something was wrong because I was always rooting for the criminal. I was like, if you, you make the wrong turn, right? <laughs> so, so I knew something was either wrong with me, the way that this was being shot, and I was intrigued. So my own interests um, are what led me to being a critical cultural media scholar. And I've always been interested in how the media mute voices, how misinformation is perpetuated, how media delegitimize rioting as a form of social protest. And I actually edited a book on the ways the media should be reporting on LGBTQ plus communities. And so I've always been very interested in marginalized people, quite frankly, because I exist in the margin. And what that means for you as a student and as a researcher is that always be brave, Always be willing to investigate topics, even when people tell you this isn't a worthwhile topic. Um, because if you can give power um, to people who are powerless, are rendered powerless by systems that are in place, that is a huge deal. Um, for me, I teach what I stand for. I am not ashamed to talk about what I will stand against. And there's a big difference between what you stand for and what you stand against. You know, Carlos, when you talk to me about things that you stand for, that's a much more passive perspective. It's almost like, well, here I have an ally. I want to know what Carlos is willing to stand against. I want to know if Carlos is going to be an accomplice with me. I don't need to tell Carlos where the body's buried. I need Carlos to show up with Vaseline and a shovel, right? I need him to be an accomplice. And so that's the difference between talking about what you stand for and what you're willing to stand against. And I've always been brave enough to talk about the things I'm willing to stand against and also to take action so that our college is positioned, that we can discuss in real ethical terms the things that we are willing to stand against as a community. And to give a voice to the community, uh, Dr. Campbell, I want to introduce you, Sanaira Lopez. You can stand up. I want to tell you why. Because she was the producer of the first uh, half an hour Spanish show we, we did 
on, on APV last semester. She started from zero. Thank you. And, and also, they are not here with us, but last semester and this semester still, we, still, uh, we have a show for uh, this voice of the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two students, uh, Nate and Harvey, and they're doing a great show. So we all, they are trying to do on APV, giving a voice to people that sometimes they don't have a voice. And that's what Sanaira was doing uh, with her show for us. She's a senior, she's leaving very soon, and I see a great future on her. What would you tell her advice for Sanaira uh, that she's going to leave school in a few weeks? Uh -huh. How's, how's the great, I tell the kids, you know, the student, my students are going to leave the nest. They're going to face the real world right now. What she's going to face when she leaves the school team from a Spanish family? Mm -hmm. and, yes, mm -hmm. so I have a lot in common, I believe. Um, I would say the advice that I would tell you is never be afraid of failure and to think of failure and mistakes as a prerequisite to progress. And sometimes it's tough when you're in the middle of it, right? I can tell you so many examples of times that I've failed in the academy and outside of the academy. But when you learn from it and you don't repeat the same mistakes, it's the only way to progress. So don't expect perfection from yourself and certainly don't expect perfection from your bosses. Don't be afraid to fail and be brave. People want you to be authentic and that's one of the things that I have to say about App State. I'm, I have brought my authentic self to work every day. You know, it's not every dean that's going to wear a long tutu to have a fireside chat. It's not every dean that's going to be radically transparent and I will admit my flaws. Um, and I will tell you one of my big step, missteps when I came here, and the faculty are aware of this, um, we had, and I think it ties nicely with this, we had the incident in the bathroom in Catherine Harbor oh, yeah. Hall where um, there were some racist epithets that were scratched on a bathroom stall. And I even, I talked to the entire faculty and I told them I made a huge misstep. And my misstep was that I didn't get up, leave my building, go to the building myself to make sure that the, um, graffiti was removed. I did everything in the interim, right? I, I filed a report, I set up a committee <laughs> to talk about racism. Uh, I did everything but get up off of my, you know what, and go over to the building. And that's a, a misstep and a regret, but it is a misstep that I will not make again, right? So it was a prerequisite for me to learn something because that's not in any handbook. No one says that I have to leave Edwin Duncan. They said, you should do these steps. So always know that you can learn from that and embrace it. That's one thing I learned from Exxon. Shine a lantern on your issue. Shine a lantern on it and learn from it. I, rem I remember a conversation we had with her last semester, and she used to tell me, maybe you can relate to her. She said, for her, she's working for the uh, Appalachian. She's working as a reporter for uh, news at App TV. Mm -hmm. She's very involved with a lot of activities at, here at school. And she always tell me before when we used to have this conversation that for her was tougher than for a white student, for being a girl of color, for being Latin. She has to work harder mm -hmm. than everybody else. That was her feeling. Do you have to work harder to, to reach that point to be a dean? Yes, absolutely, and it doesn't stop. And the reason that I will say for everyone that I feel like I had to work harder is because I exist in the margin, and the world is made for the mainstream, right? And so even the language we use, when, when someone who is from the mainstream says, I don't see color, that's the biggest insult to me because I am different. And I do bring a different perspective. And I bring a unique view. I want you to see me for that. And when you say you don't see that, what it tells me is that you think I'm just like you because you're in the mainstream. It's never that you're just like me. If someone says this is a crossover hit in pop music, or, or it means that it's crossed to the mainstream. It never means that anything mainstream has crossed into the margins where a lot of us live where a lot of us operate, where a lot of us are the most comfortable. So even the language that we use always enfranchises the mainstream. And that's not who we are. And so some of the po point of us working harder is just the fact that our existence is different. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Um, and also what we consider
soldier is working harder is measuring it against a mainstream. Maybe we work at a rate that we have to work at. Maybe we work at a rate um, that is comfortable for who we are in the margins. And maybe if we reframe it and think about it that way, it won't be so, um, it won't be such a heavy burden to bear. But that's not going to end. That's not going to end. So that what that means is you have to prepare and you have to persevere. So when you get knocked down, you get back up. That's the key. Because you're going to get knocked down, but you have to get up. And, and you have to just go further. You know, when I look at everyone in this audience, you're the future, I'm not. I'm over 50 years old. I know I look good, but I'm over 50 years old, right? I'm not the future, you are. So you have to take that, acknowledge that you bring something new and innovative, and don't let people who are like us take that away from you. You know, we've done, and are continuing to do our thing, but we want to see where you can go. But you have a position of power here, and the reality is we can see all those faces here. It, it reflect the House uh, Appalachian. Appalachian is a primary white institution. Yes. Most of them. And what Sanera was telling me, also another student of color, tell me that it's not easy mm -hmm. to be a primary white school, to be a person of color for them. Sometimes they feel uncomfortable, some, Sometimes they don't feel like that. You have a power of position. Mm -hmm. uh, looking to the future from your perspective, what initiative would you like to see? Or where do you think we can go to the College of Fine and Apply Arts to make this a more welcoming, inclusive environment for faculty, staff, and those students who sometimes they don't feel comfortable because they are not white students? Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think the main thing that I can do um, and what I'm committed to doing is to move our college from um, a perspective of belonging, because when I first arrived, that's all I heard. At App State, you belong. I don't need anyone to tell me I belong. I I'm here, I belong wherever I am, right? I got here on the same merits as everyone else. I don't need you to tell me I belong. Here's what I need you to tell me. I need you to tell me that I matter, because belonging is internal. Wherever I am, I'll find my place. But mattering is external to me. Mattering means that you care enough about me to take my perspectives into account, to really listen more than you speak, um, to recognize my truth, which might be different than yours. And I'm going to say something that's a little controversial. This won't surprise anyone. When we think about Black Lives Matter, that's what the, the whole movement is saying. It's just to let me know that I matter to you. It's external to me. It puts a little bit of the onus on you. It's bigger than just saying, I belong. Because when someone says, you belong, guess what, they're in power. They're saying, I'm already here. <laughs> I'm here, I'm in the academy, and I will bring you along too, aren't you lucky? Mattering is external to me. Mattering means that you're gonna say, I'm gonna take what you have to say into consideration. Um, you know, we're all bound by our own standpoint epistemologies. We all know what we know based on our own culture, our teachers, our clergy, the schools that we attended. That influences everything that we know. So my truth is different than some other people's truth. Please honor that truth and know that you don't have a monopoly on the truth. It's just your truth. And as a journalist, you should know that the truth only comes from multiple perspectives. You know, Carlos, one of the things that I will say about journalism, journalism education that I think is a deficit is the way that a couple of things, the way that we expect journalists to be objective and to remove themselves, that is a colonialist perspective, that is a masculine perspective. It doesn't take into account the way that other cultures tell stories, um, but we say, get. Three yes, get three no, and that's balance. That's not balance. Balance is the way something is equally distributed across the scale. Are you getting a breadth of perspectives? Are you honoring multiple truths? Or are you just getting three people who agree with your perspective, three people who don't agree, now you've got balance and you remove yourself? You know, my newest research is dealing with the psychic trauma of journalists. 
So black journalists who had to cover a lot of the tragedies that have occurred. Um, Latinx journalists who cover the separation of families at the border um, and the imprisonment, um, I would say the internment of um, brown people from South America, Central America, Mexico at the border. The same thing for LGBTQ, the same thing for Asian reporters. So um, that's my, my latest research is because all other first responders get this sort of assistance, help. Uh, journalists don't, and journalists are oftentimes first responders as well. And then afterwards have to keep retelling the story. There's a lot of psychic trauma in this, in this job that we don't talk about. Absolutely, and it's something really, I, I mean, I'm really interesting because I'm working in this business for all my life. Uh, I'm close to my 60s, I'm going to be 60 next year. You look good too. I look good too. <laughs> I, I was expecting you to say that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. The problem now with the media is that, I mean, when I make, when we start talking and I make the joke, you know, CNN, okay, how much you hate uh, Donald Trump, you know, because people who don't like Trump, they're going to watch uh, CNN, mm -hmm. people who who they think they like the world in the right, they like Donald Trump, they're going to watch Fox and they're going to get, and the problem with the media is, and I know this because I was inside work for CNN for more than 20 years, 22, uh, this is a business too. Oh, absolutely. It's a business, so I mean, they want to have more audience. So what I mean, if CNN is going to talk about something that, oh, what the great things Donald Trump did, the audience is going to be upset. They are not going to like it, and maybe they are not going to watch that. And Fox the same. Fox is going to try to feed those people who are on the right and they hate the left. So what I mean, it's a situation that really upset me, how the media uh, is working right now. And I asked some of my students, and some of them agree, you know, it's not the way. I mean, because you were talking about, I mean, the objective to be fair. But I think as a reporter, we shouldn't take sides. Uh, and many times we said, you know, Facts, facts are so important, we have to tell the truth. But all, sometimes they tell you half, half uh -huh. of the truth. They don't tell you the other half. And we are not doing our job in the right way. You know, I think the problem with that is not necessarily whether or not we take sides. But Carlos, when I was growing up, and if you were in St. Louis, Missouri, there were three daily papers, mm -hmm. and the main paper came out twice a day. So it wasn't a matter of, um, trying to be objective, you knew which paper was going to report what, but you got multiple perspectives. Now, in major cities, there's one paper, one perspective, and it comes out once a day, and that's all you get. And you just don't have the, we had family-owned papers, we had um, a really robust ethnic press. All of those are dying and, as you know, being concentrated and are now owned by large corporations. And what does that say? It says that the business, it's, you know, when you think about journalism, it's a cathedral, there's this truth, uh, and a bank. And the bank is taking over the cathedral. And I think that's the real issue. And to make things more complicated, now we have social media. Yes. And social media, everybody who's at home, maybe is on the basement, they think they're a reporter because they can write and maybe somebody give them some likes and retweets. That's something we have to deal also as a journalist. But I want to ask you a question. I mean, we can go back to this later. But something some of the professors asked me, mm -hmm. they said there is often a disconnect between scholarship and practice. Okay. You agree with that? They said that they study and discuss many things, but they often don't translate into practice, specifically in academia. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how have you taken the things you have studied and applied them to your leadership mm -hmm. position, decision making? Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking that. Um, for me, as you all know, like I said, I, I am a public intellectual by choice, uh, and I am a critical cultural media scholar by practice and trade. And so the whole idea of making sure that marginalized voices are heard, I bring that to work every day. So when I meet at an executive level and decisions are being made, first of all, to be clear, I'm the only person who looks like this in the room most of the time. Okay, so I feel as though it is my obligation to bring that truth to that environment. Now, I'm always advocating for my college, and everybody knows that. Everything that I say is going to be biased. It's College of Fine and Applied Arts first. As far as I'm concerned, we're the college at the university that separates the university from being a trade school. 
We're makers, we're doers, we're dreamers. That's who we are. Um, and so I feel like we hold a really special place at the university. But when decisions are being made at an executive level, I bring a first generation college student perspective to the room. And I'm, I'm proud of that and I'm always brave enough um, to speak up. Um, I don't need validation. I'm not used to validation. So I don't need validation, but I'm going to speak a truth that is separate from everyone in the classroom. And I know that I have made a difference because I have stopped certain policies from going forward and I have pushed certain policies going forward with the expressed interest of first gen and marginalized students in mind when I did that. Can you give us some examples with policies you stop and I mean, maybe some people <laughs> try, but I don't know, but you don't have to give the details. Okay. Um, I'll give one with a, a few details. Okay. Okay. We, we like details. Okay. There uh, was at one point um, a policy being discussed and considered that that was, you know, all incoming freshmen really should determine their major as they come into the university. Um, and that way it would help and they started listing all of these things that it would do and the way that it would enfranchise the student and I thought, and so I finally, I just, I couldn't, I had to speak up. I said, listen, as a first gen college student, I never even heard of my own major. I didn't even know what a public relations practitioner was until I got into college and started taking classes. I came from a high school that wasn't a wealthy high school. I didn't know, we didn't have psychology, sociology, anthropology. There are so many things that really might pique my interest that I may not know as a freshman and as a first gen college student, I only know it if I see it on TV. And um, so I just, re that was one of the things that I, I stopped dead in its tracks because I felt like it continued to disenfranchise people who were already in the margins, um, who had already gotten to college against all odds, um, and who shouldn't now be further marginalized and pushed into a major that may not be right for them because it was all they knew when they got here. When they know better, they can choose better. Um, so I thought that was an important one. I'm glad you repeat that because I mean, in Latin America, I'm from Argentina, when you finish high school, you go to, if you want to study medicine, you go straight to the medi med medicine school. Law, you go to the law school. You don't have a chance like you have here in the USA to have the first two years, you know, to get all that knowledge that you wouldn't get if you go straight to, if you want to be a economy, you go, I mean, that's the way we do in Latin America. And people are thinking to change that, you know, they're mm -hmm. thinking to, they, they should do it like here in the USA. So what I mean. Yeah. Now I would like to ask you, uh, about what are some of the top issues you think we face in terms of DEI mm -hmm. as a society, as a society more broadly? Okay. I think when I would think about um, DEI, and, and I'm thinking about this from a societal issue, and you want to know what, what issues and problems mm -hmm. I see, mm -hmm. okay, um, I would see two um, access. Um, and then attitude. Um, and when I think about access, I'm not thinking about that in, in a traditional sense. <laughs> but also the kind of access that allows us to even recognize what privilege is. You know, some people who exist in the mainstream, because everything is set up to enfranchise people in the mainstream, they don't even recognize the privilege that they have. These are just things that are, they just exist. They don't, they don't critically analyze them. Um, and so, and, and for those of us in the margin, access means something different. But access to information that really provokes us, that challenges us, that makes us question, um, that's what we don't have access to. And I don't think it's an accident that when you come out of high school, you're only taught how to ask the question why. You're never taught how to envision a world that doesn't exist and then ask the question why not. That's what you get at a university. Well, guess what? Only about 20% of the population get an undergraduate degree. Right? It keeps us separate, it keeps us divided, 
It keeps us unable to create coalitions across class. But each of us should be able to envision a world that doesn't exist and ask the question, why not? And then get to work. That's what your job is as part of this educated elite. Like we've said, only 20% of the population are going to get to where you are today. You are a part of the educated elite. And what does that mean? Because you've had access to this sort of an education. What does that mean? That means that you should lift as you climb. And it means that you, you absolutely have to operate with no sense of arrogance, you know, I'm from the Ozarks. We don't tolerate braggarts and things like that. So when I come into a position, there is no arrogance. There is no elitism. Um, I will learn from everyone. I know that knowledge can come from anywhere. And I hope that that's something that you will take with you as well. So that's that access. And then attitude. If you think about what attitude is, if you think about a person as a bullseye, what lies at the center is the hardest to change. Those are my ethics. What the next ring of the bullseye would be are, are my beliefs. But at the outer ring are my attitudes. And attitudes are the easiest to change. Um, but we have to have access to knowledge to change those attitudes. Um, and everyone is tired. Everyone's tired, right? I mean, when you think about examples of human rights violations, when you think about environmental injustice, when you think about institutionalized racism, and you think about the fact that you have to combat all of that, you get exhausted. I'm exhausted, right? I just came from a conference with um, Roxane Gay, and she said, be tired, right? <laughs> like, I'm tired. And we're all tired, and that's okay. We can be exhausted. Um, and it's really hard to empathize with people when you're tired, when you're emotionally spent. But that's what it takes. It takes us all being able to empathize and us all being willing to empathize and to make mistakes. You have to know I'm gonna make mistakes and I have to accept that you're going to make mistakes. But just be willing to empathize and be willing to change those attitudes. And sometimes people interpret a lack of activity as an attitude of, of a lack of care, when really sometimes a lack of activity is self-care. So sometimes I have to disengage um, because there are a lot of expectations. I'm the only black dean, I'm the only black female in the room oftentimes, and there are a lot of expectations on me from a lot of people and a lot of constituents. And sometimes I have to disengage as a way of self-care. But always be willing to change your attitudes. Your attitudes are just things that you like or you don't like. Um, I might like something today, I learn something new, I might not like it tomorrow. Don't ever feel like, and this is also sort of a, a systemic way of keeping us in our place. Don't ever feel like you can't change. Don't ever feel like you can't grow. Um, you know, at my age, and I'm in my 50s as I've said, I look forward, I am future facing. I don't look back. Um, the things that I've done in the past, I really don't look back. I am excited about the future. Um, and really, a lot of that has to do with your generation, to be perfectly honest. Um, but sometimes an inaction um, is necessary. But I also want you to know that a lot of times when I think about what upsets me, it's the inertia, it's the lack of progress, it's, um, and that's also what brings on fatigue. For those of us who are doing the work and we just see very little progress <laughs> and we see all of the obstacles and we're constantly facing the obstacles, that's also a source of fatigue. But we have to change our attitude about that as well and really think of things as this is another opportunity for me to show people who I am, what I'm capable of, what we can be together to build coalitions. So. But in the society, I see that I agree with you. People are tired. Mm -hmm. There is a fatigue. But people get upset too. Mm -hmm. And people are losing their patience. And you can see, you know, we were talking Black Lives Matter, or you see the movement, it was outside all over the, the country. People are upset. Uh, people get upset for, for little things. We, on the Oscar, there was news Will Smith because he was really upset for a joke that Chris Rock made. So he acted violently. And how we can control, or I mean, we are tired, we are upset, yes. and 
We don't have to react crazy. How we can control that? Well, I think that's where the self-care comes in. Um, and it's really important to do that. And that's something that uh, I never really did until recently. Um, I always was a fighter. It's, it's in my nature uh, to just fight, 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 to keep going um, and never recharge and regroup. But I think the self-care is critical. Um, and I know what it, what it means to be frustrated. Um, if not to make this a race to the bottom, but I will tell you, I deal with microaggressions every day. Just being a black woman in Boone, I deal with microaggressions every day. I deal with microaggressions on this campus. Um, I'll give you an example. And I saw, uh, I think I saw Shen Shen and Ashley out at um, the local one night and I was with a group of deans and I think I came by and I said, oh, we're going to the basketball game because they were acknowledging people on the deans list. Well, after that, I got separated from the other deans. And as you all know, I'm the only black dean, right? So I said, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll walk over. I know where the home center is. Um, I'll walk over and I had my purse. So I go into the home center by myself I have on my name tag, I wear that on campus purposefully because it helps me avoid a lot of microaggressions, okay? I don't, this isn't by chance that I have this on. So I have my name tag on and I go up and the person says, oh, oh, you can't come in here without a clear bag. We have a clear bag policy. Oh, I understand that, but uh, we're honoring uh, people on the Dean's List and I'm the Dean of the College of Fine and Applied Arts and I can't miss this, I'm expected to be here. Can I remove everything from my bag? And you check it and then I put everything back in? Nope, nope, nope. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, but my car is way back at Edwin Duncan. I can't go back and get back here in time. It's important that I'm here. And so finally, I, I got a little loud. And so by the time I ended, there were four people who finally said, just let her through. And I'm by myself. So I get in and uh, I sit and I'm sitting in a section and I'm by myself and one of the deans called and they say, we can see where you are, you're in the wrong section, come around here. So I go to the other section, everybody has their purse with them, right? So I go, oh my God, did you get stopped at the door? What did? And they were like, for what? What do you mean for what? And, but I didn't, I, I let it go because I wanted to enjoy the basketball game, right? But I deal with that all the time. Here on campus, Sunday, I went to a play and I told, I was with the Dean of the Libraries. I said, I don't have the tickets. The tickets are in my office. She said, ah, don't worry about it. Uh, let's just go, you're the Dean, you have on your name tag. So we get up there, I said, well, you know, I don't have my tickets, but I did have two tickets reserved. And, uh, and they were like, eh, no, no, no. So the white Dean said, listen, I'm the dean of the libraries, because I kind of looked at her like, help me, you, you've been in this situation with me before. I'm the dean of the libraries, she's the dean of the College of Fine Arts. So when she spoke, someone came up behind us, gave us the two tickets, and we went in. A bitch be tired. Absolutely. I mean, we have here people from the Appalachian, it was an article that they published in January, and the article already got my attention. It said that uh, some uh, black faculty, they think it's a, there is a toxic environment in the university. And for your example, they take us there, and they were giving some number that between, it was, uh, maybe they can help me the number, I think it was from 2015 to 2020, uh, like 21 uh, black professors that didn't renew the contract or they left the school because, I mean, they were not feeling comfortable with the way they were treated here upon what you are telling us. Can we change that? I think so. Because I will say this, I have all, at the same time, those are isolated incidents. Overwhelmingly, I have been welcomed with open arms. As I've said before, I don't put on a front when I come to work. I am, have been able to bring my authentic self to work. Um, I don't act like something that I'm not. I have, you know, I dress the way that I choose to. I wear my hair in a natural hairstyle. I've never felt as though I needed to act or be something that I'm not. I'm grateful for that here. There, there are pervasive microaggressions that do occur. From It is an absolute incognizant racism, but it's racism still, 
right? It is um, not intentional, but it still impacts me. Absolutely. Um, that said, overwhelmingly people um, want to do the right thing, and that's why I think you can't be afraid to make mistakes, and you, you have to listen and accept my truth just like I have to listen and accept yours. Right? Because there are some people who will never experience that sort of microaggression. And I will tell you, if you have a choice to be a part of a movement, that's a privilege. Right? I don't have a choice. My life depends on this. My livelihood, I don't have a choice. I have to be a part of black. My life has to matter. It absolutely has to matter. If you have a choice, that's a privilege. Um, I have to earn equal pay. I don't want to eat cat food when I retire. That's not a choice for me as a woman, right? But these are, there are these coalitions that we can build, and you don't have to be a part of a group to be an accomplice with the group. And I don't need any more allies. I don't need any more people who say they've got my back. All of my career, someone has told me they've had my back, and when I look back for them, they're so far back, Carlos, that I'm like, <laughs> help, right? I need an accomplice. So, but I think things always change, always get better now. Here's the thing. Should we wait for evolutionary change? No. Should we be a part of revolutionary change? Absolutely, if not now, when? Um, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take action. Guys, I remind you, you know, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. This is a small room. You don't need a microphone. So that I mean, I mean, if you want to participate of the conversation, yes, because I'm please. sure you have a lot of feedback to give us. And I was said before, the follow-up is so important. So the only thing you have to do, raise your hands, and I let you ask a question. I want to ask you now, we talk a lot here now in these times about the cancel culture, yeah. call-out culture. Uh, I would like to know what's your perspective on cancel culture and what mechanism might you advocate to better communicate with one another? Mm -hmm. To be clear, I'm not down with the council culture. I'm just not. I think that we all will make mistakes and we all deserve grace. Um, I cannot imagine if I was held to a certain level. I, if I, I don't know what I don't know. And a lot of people are not trying to be malicious. As I've said, it's, it is racism, but it's incognizant. And it's a learning opportunity. You know, one of the things, Carlos, that I think it's important, I lead with kindness. And that doesn't mean that I'm not firm. And it doesn't mean that I'm not assertive. And it doesn't mean that I don't hold people accountable. But I always believe in rehabilitation and redemption. Um, and if someone didn't believe in that for me, I wouldn't be where I am. So I'm not down with the cancel culture. I am incredibly down with learning opportunities, taking advantage of those opportunities. When you know better, you do better. Having restorative justice so that people who are wronged have an opportunity to feel as though there is a healing that takes place. But as far as canceling people um, for making mistakes um, and, and making those mistakes in a public way, and then them never being able to recover, I think that that shows a deficit on my part. Not on their part, that's a me problem. Because I should be able to uh, accept and also give grace. Dr. Campbell, now I would like to talk about the, talk again about DEI, and I would like to know how, how has DEI affected your life path and made a difference on you? Well, it's no secret, I, I um, am a diverse person. I'm black, I'm female, um, I'm a first generation college student. Um, and I believe fiercely in the American dream, uh, quite simply because I am absolutely an exemplar of it. You know, I, it's no secret if you know me, I'm always proud to say my mother grew up picking cotton in um, Tucson, Arizona. Um, in a place called um, Eloy, uh, Pima Cotton, Pima County, um, Arizona. My father cultivated rice in Arkansas. My grandparents were all domestic workers. My great-grandfather, Bob, was enslaved. 
And this is how far my family has come in such a short time. That's only possible in a country like this. I know that by my birthright, I have privilege and I have access just by where I was born. I get that. Um, so for me, the fact that I have to work hard, eh, okay. But I bring a sense of joy, regardless of what's happening with DEI, I bring a, a sense of joy uh, to my job, to my life. Every day I have an obligation to, because I stand on the shoulders of people who didn't have uh, joy, who didn't, weren't able to express that the way that I'm able to express that joy. I have an obligation to, to be joyful. Okay, so that's what, there are times when I'm tired, but I always remain joyful, I always remain hopeful. And that's what I want you all um, to recognize, especially as young people. Always have the audacity to be hopeful. No matter what's happening, no matter how bleak a situation is, have the audacity to be joyful and to have hope. Because I'm telling you, there is no way that my own grandmother could have even hoped that I would be where I am today. She wouldn't have had the language to even express that this is something she wanted for me. My mother, my own mother and father, just never dreamed that me, my sister who's also um, a doctor, my brother who has an MBA, they just never would have dreamed of that. And that's what can happen, but you always have to have hope. Things get better, things always get better. Um, like I said, it's our job to make sure things get better at a pace that we are comfortable with. Your parents aren't gonna do it. I'm not gonna do that, you have to do that. And uh, you have the tools to do that. Um, especially as people who are being educated in communication. Because let me tell you what narrative drives. Narrative drives my beliefs, and narrative drives policy. Once people start talking about things, and once it becomes part of a public consciousness, that's what drives policy. I can't think of a more powerful major in college than communication because of the power that you have to tell stories, to empower people, um, and to just put subject matter into the national psyche. But DEI has impacted my life because I'm a diverse person. Um, and I have reaped the benefits and I have also dealt with the pitfalls of what that meant. Uh, but for me, it meant always being two things, prepared, um, always be prepared, and then being willing to persevere and be genuine, bring your authentic self wherever you are. Because the last thing you want to do is to uh, bring your representative and then your authentic self shows up one day. Right? You want to be authentic from day one. You owe that to yourself um, so that you can live a, a comfortable, joyful life. Absolutely. I agree with you. But I mean, for me, it's, I'm, I'm new at teaching. This is my second year. Uh -huh. I know before I was a journalist. Uh, but I'm, when I talk to those young students, 20, 21, I mean, I'm glad they are so open. And some of them, they don't have any problem to talk. Maybe when I went to school, they didn't, we didn't talk so much about mental issues. Yeah. And they talk a lot, you know. I said, I have some is mental issues. I mean, I cannot go to class. I understand that. But it's, and I'm going to tell you something. Maybe you can advise me on that. Today, one senior, she's ready to grab. I mean, she came to me, and she, I'm her advisor. And she said, you were talking about the importance of to study communication. She's very sweet girl. And she started to cry in my class because she said, you know, I'm really frustrated. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I have my degree in a few in a few weeks. I'm going to be electronic media broadcasting. Maybe I don't know what to do. I mean, I've been applying to different uh, places. I mean, so far, no luck. Uh, she was really upset. Mm -hmm. She was really upset. And I mean, what would you do in a case like when a student comes to you and I said, you know, I'm really frustrated. I don't know how, what's going to happen with my life, with my major, communication, and what would you tell huh. uh, 20, 22 or 21 years? I think I would tell them what, what I would think you would tell them. You never imagined yourself here. Here you are at this stage in your life, and you're in a job that you just started two years ago. I never imagined that I would be here. I didn't take, listen, there's no such thing as a career ladder that you just climb. That is an absolute farce. 
it is, like I said, a, an American Ninja obstacle course. You're gonna have starts and stops in your career. There's gonna be zigs and zags. There's gonna be warped walls. There's going to be oil slicks places. And you're gonna slide backwards and forwards, but you're going to get to where you're meant to be. And, and don't fret about it. Um, also, again, you have to drop all sense of arrogance and you have to be willing to take whatever job it is as long as you are following your passion. And for me, a big part of what success meant for me was being able to be authentically myself, right? So if worse comes to worse for me, my mom has a twin size bed in Waynesville, Missouri with my Michael Jackson posters on the wall. I'll go home if I have to go home. I, what I won't do is I won't sell out and I won't try to be something that I'm not and I won't not bring my authentic self to work. There are certain things that I just will not do. You have to have those things too. There are certain things that you have to say, I will not stand for. And, and you always have to draw a line or else you're gonna find yourself like I was at Exxon where I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror because of some of the things that I was being asked to do. Draw those lines early, know what they are for you, and, and just know that none of us knew that we would be here. Uh, we just somehow got here. Prepare and persevere. Prepare and persevere. You're gonna get knocked down, get back, up. Just get up. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're going to say every job, I'm, I'm going to get a promotion. There are times even in the academy where I moved back because I knew someplace wasn't a healthy place for me and it wasn't a good space for me. Um, and for a lot of years, I lived someone else's dream for me. So when I came into the academy, when I got a PhD, no one in my family had a PhD. And it was my dissertation director who said, Shannon, you need to be at this type of school. So off to that type of school I went. I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't dealing with the types of students where I felt like I was making a difference. Uh, but I was living her dream for me. And once I stopped doing that, once you stop living your parents' dream for your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, what society thinks of you, be true to yourself. You owe it to yourself. Trust me, this life just flies by. You owe it to yourself to sort of live in a way that brings you joy, um, that is authentic for you, and, and you should do so unapologetically. You know, if people don't like what I do, I tell them, avert your eyes, right? Because this, this is not changing, right? So you do the same, do the same. My name is Melissa Weddle and I'm Department Chair of Recreation Management and Physical Education at Appalachian State University. We offer two degree granting programs, one in Recreation Management with a focus in Outdoor Experiential Education, Recreation and Park Management, and Commercial Recreation and Tourism. Our second degree granting program in Health, Physical Education, and Coaching offers teacher certification for public schools in health and physical education. You can get a minor or certificate in coaching. We are the front porch to the Beaver College of Health Science, where our focus is on quality of life, wellness, and physical activity. We're located in the beautiful mountains of Boone, North Carolina. So come join us, check out our website, or take a class.